This question says, two identical cars are traveling down a straight road. The first car moves with the speed of U, while the second car moves with the speed of 3U. At any given point, both cars break uniformly to come to a complete stop. If both cars stop in the same distance, determine the value of the ratio of F2 over F1, where these are the forces acting on the first and second car, respectively. So, if we have car 1 here, and we have car 2 here, and car 2 is moving faster than car 1. So, this has an initial velocity of u, this has an initial velocity of 3u. Both cars are going to come to rest at the red line. So their final velocity is going to be zero. And it said that they both moved a displacement or a distance of s, or they moved through the same distance. So the idea is that both cars have uh, energy kinetic at the beginning, and then they have zero energy at the end. And what was happening is that there was a force acting in this direction to slow each car down. Now, if we think about this, if these are identical cars, right, let's look at first how their energies compare. So energy kinetic of one is simply going to be one half mv squared, or in this case, you know, our v would be our u, right, our initial velocity. Uh, for energy kinetic of two, that's going to be one half m 3v squared, which is going to be 9, because we square that 3, 1 half mv squared. So the kinetic energy of car 2 is 9 times as great the kinetic energy of car 1 because it's going 3 times as fast. And so we have to square that 3, and that's how we get the 9. So if we look at this, the idea is that there is work that is done on the, each car to bring it to rest. And the amount of work is equal to the amount of energy that it initially had. So for each of these scenarios, the energy kinetic uh, minus the, or, or let's, let's just say this, plus the work done external, right? That's done by friction and that equals zero. At the end of our scenario, there is no energy, there's no potential or anything like that. So my setup for my equation is going to look like this. My work is going to be a negative value, and that's because my force is to the left and my displacement is to the right. So if we look at a car individually, okay, it would be a frictional force or some resistive force, which is pushing to the left, whereas my displacement is to the right. And our equation for work, which is going to be F times displacement, cosine theta. And the idea is that the angle between these two, right? So if we draw our S up here, our angle between these two is 180 degrees. They're pointing in opposite directions. And so that makes the cosine of 180 negative one. And so our work is a negative work. And that makes sense because we had initial energy and then our final energy is zero. So we lost energy due to the work done here. So if we set this up, what we have is we have uh, one, our, oh, excuse me, we have our energy kinetic is going to equal force times displacement, right? We put a negative there, we add it over. So our energy is going to equal our work, which is force times displacement. And our force is going to equal our energy divided by our displacement for each scenario. So if we're trying to make this fraction of F2 over F1, right, F2 divided by F1, that's basically going to be 9 energy kinetic divided by S over energy kinetic divided by S. And so what's going to happen is my S's are going to cancel out. <clears throat> and essentially what we have is we have the energy kinetics are going to cancel out as well, but I'm just trying to show this. Nine energy kinetic for car two over energy kinetic. So because the car two has nine times the energy, 
essentially what we're going to have is we're going to have nine times the force because there's just a one right here. So that fraction that we would have would be nine over one for the ratio of force two divided by force one. So this question says, a, not, a green ball of mass M falls from rest with an initial height of H. A red ball of mass M falls from rest of 2H. What is the ratio of their kinetic energy of the red ball to the kinetic energy of the green ball? Energy kinetic red over energy kinetic green when they, are separate, uh, when they separately reach the ground. Our correct answer is going to be 2, and so let's prove why that makes sense. So we have a green ball. And we have a red ball. So here's our, well, let's, let's draw the ground first. So here's our ground. Okay, that's our height equals zero. We're going to have a green ball. And we'll draw it here. And we have a red ball, which is basically twice the height. So this has a height of h, and this has a height of 2h, and both of their masses are the same, right? Mass and mass. So it says, what is the ratio of the kinetic energy when the balls reach the ground? So if we think about what's going to happen, this has potential energy due to gravity. This also has potential energy due to gravity. When they reach the ground here and here, they are going to both have kinetic energy. So if we look at the, the green ball and the red ball, how would we write their equations of energy? We would have energy gravity or energy potential due to gravity equals energy kinetic and energy gravity uh, potential due to gravity. Sorry, I'm mixing those up. Equals energy kinetic. So if we write that out, that's simply going to be MGH equals energy kinetic for my green ball, and it's going to be mg2h equals energy kinetic for my red ball. So if we see this, then essentially if energy kinetic is for the green, the red is going to have two energy kinetic because it starts from twice that height. So if we're looking at this ratio of energy kinetic red, so energy kinetic red divided by energy kinetic of the green, Basically, what we're going to get is we're going to get two energy kinetic divided by energy kinetic. Those cancel out, and we simply get a ratio of two over one or two. So this question looks at a box of mass M is held on the top of an inclined plane of height H. Friction between the inclined plane and the box is negligible. The box slides down the plane until it reaches the ground level with the speed of V. Continue sliding along the ground, which has a coefficient of friction mu until it comes to a complete stop after a distance of s, which of the following is the correct expression for the coefficient of friction. So let's look at this question. Here's our ramp. Here's our slides. So we're going to have our box at the top of the ramp at some height h. Right? So this is the height h right here. It's going to slide down the ramp until it gets here. And at this point, it's going to hit friction. And so because of that, it's going to come to rest here at the very end. So our final velocity is zero. Our initial velocity here, because it's held at rest at the top, is zero. But at the very bottom, it has some velocity v. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at what is the coefficient of friction during this portion of the motion. So let's first just zoom in on the box as it's moving. Right? So as it's sliding across our friction, the forces that are going to be acting on the box are going to be the force of gravity down. We're going to have our reaction force, which is normal force, up. And then we're going to have a frictional force pointing to the left, even though we're moving to the right. On the ramp, we're going to have our force of gravity down, and our normal force is going to be perpendicular. And there's really no other forces because it says friction is negligible on that inclined plane. So let's look at how we could apply energy to this scenario. At the top, we're going to have energy uh, potential due to gravity. At the bottom, that energy is going to turn completely into kinetic. And at the end, our energy is essentially zero. We've lost all that energy. And that's because during this portion of my motion, there is work being done by friction. It 
moved some distance s and so we're going to have work there so let's let's apply our s here and if we understand this this is going to be work which is going to be negative it's going to be negative because our force is opposite our displacement the angle between those is 180 degrees so if we're trying to find the coefficient of friction we first need to understand that the uh, some of the forces in the x direction are simply going to be my frictional force uh, equals mass times acceleration remember frictional force is going to be my coefficient of friction versus my or multiplied by my normal force and in this case we know the normal force is going to be mass times gravity because that's equal to <clears throat> excuse me that's equal to the, the normal force so our coefficient of friction is going to equal my frictional force divided by my mass times gravity. And in order to continue to move forward with this question, I simply need to figure out how can I find what my frictional force is. So to do that, that's where we're going to apply the concepts of energy within this. So at the beginning, we have energy potential due to gravity. That converts into energy kinetic at the bottom. And that is all going to be, or excuse me, that's we're going to uh, subtract the work done by friction. And that's going to equal zero at the end because there is no potential. There is no kinetic energy here at the end. So if we're looking at this, we're going to say energy potential due to gravity is going to equal my energy kinetic, which is going to equal the work done by friction. So we can apply our frictional uh, work and our potential energy at the beginning and see how we can use that to find that frictional force. So my potential energy due to gravity is MGH. The work done by friction is going to be force of friction multiplied by S, by displacement. And so I need to solve for this force of friction. So to do that, I'm going to divide each side by S. And I would get that the force of friction is going to equal uh, mgh divided by s. So now what I can do is I can simply plug this force of friction into this equation for my coefficient of dynamic friction and solve for mu. So my coefficient of friction is going to be mgh divided by s divided by mg. <clears throat> Looking at that, mg's cancel out, and so I'm left with simply h divided by s. So how high was the block on the ramp, and how far did the block slide after it hit that friction? So another way to write that, which might help people, would be mgh divided by s, and then instead of dividing by uh another number, we can simply multiply, multiply by the reciprocal, which would be 1 over mg. And so again, here we can see that mgs are going to cancel out, and the thing that I would be left with would simply be h over s. So this question says, an object is dropped from rest and hits the ground. Which graph shows the object's kinetic energy varies with height above the ground as it falls? So uh, our best answer is going to be this one, and so let's talk about why the height right so as the object is here if this is our ground the greater the height if that's our maximum height our kinetic energy is going to be zero and then as that object falls so as our height decreases our kinetic energy should increase now why is it a linear relationship well because if we think about what did it have here? It had energy potential due to gravity, and then it converted into energy kinetic. So energy potential due to gravity equals energy kinetic. And if I were to write this out, that's mgh equals energy kinetic. So we don't need to solve for kinetic or velocity. We're just simply looking at how does the height relate to that. Right? And what we see is that this is a linear relationship that as if we were to simply solve for 
EK, right? And write this in terms of Y equals MX plus B. <clears throat> we would write it in a way of uh, EK equals MG times H plus zero. <clears throat> uh, well, actually, we, we don't need to worry about this zero. But essentially, we can rewrite this uh, as my slope of my line is mass times gravity. And then my x variable is the height. So we can see that this would be a constant slope. This slope here would equal mass times gravity. And that energy kinetic is simply a linear relationship compared to height. So this question says spring of spring constant 55 newtons uh, per meter is used to launch a wooden block up a rough slope. The block reaches a distance D along the slope before sliding back down. The block has a mass of 60, kilo, uh, 60 grams. The spring is compressed five centimeters from the point shown in the diagram. The coefficient of dynamic friction of mu D between the block and the slope is 0.61. Calculate the distance D. So a few things we need to do first is we're simply going to uh, write some values in SI units. So 60 grams is going to be 0 0.6 zero kilograms uh, sorry point zero so that's zero point zero six zero kilograms uh, five centimeters is going to be zero point zero five meters and everything else looks good coefficient of dynamic friction is unitless and then spring constant K is in 55 newtons per meter. So looking at this, we have the spring compressed. So what we have here is we have energy uh, potential due to <clears throat> uh, the spring. That spring is going to launch it upwards, giving it potential energy. And then eventually it's going to stop here. So we have to think about as it's moving upwards, what are the forces that are going to be acting? So there's going to be the force of gravity. We're going to break that force into its two components, both its parallel and its perpendicular. And the parallel component is pushing down the ramp, so that's slowing it down. Uh, we have our normal force acting on the block, and we're also going to have friction, right, up a rough slope. So we're going to have a frictional force which is pointing down the ramp as well. So looking at the sum of the forces, and we'll call that the x direction, and we'll just say for the sake of the motion that up the ramp is the positive direction. So that's going to be uh, minus the force parallel, minus the force of friction, equals mass times acceleration. So we see that both of these forces are combining to reduce the energy of the wooden block. And if we look at this, we're, we're trying to find D, right? So the idea is <clears throat> the energy that we have initially is all potential. We're going to have some energy here at the top, which is going to be uh, due to gravity. And we have these are not going to equal each other because we have work done on the system, not only by gravity, right, but also by friction. If there was, if it was just gravity, these two would be equal. However, with friction involved as well, this should be less than this. So our equation we're going to write is energy uh, potential due to the spring minus the work done by friction, because that's my external force, is going to equal the energy potential due to gravity. And again, we're trying to solve for this idea of D. Now, as we're going through this question, right, uh, this is simply going to be one half kx squared minus the force of friction times the distance up the ramp equals mass times gravity times height. So if we look at this question, we know K that's given here. We know X that's given here. Uh, distance is what we're solving for. The force of friction, <clears throat> we can solve for. 
mass we know, gravity we know, and height we can solve for. So here's how we're going to do that, right? One thing is if we look at our ramp, and if the block ends here, and we know this angle is 35, and we know this distance here up the ramp, then we can say if this is distance here and this is h here, how would I solve for that? So that is my sine function, which is going to provide that, right? So the sine of theta is going to be opposite, which is h divided by my hypotenuse, which is d. So h is simply going to be d sine theta. <clears throat> so I can plug that in to there. Everything else we know, K, X, I was trying to solve for D, M, G, we just solve, we just replaced H with D as well. And really what we need is we need our force of friction. So understanding what force of friction is, is that the force of friction is going to be mu times my uh, reaction force, which in this case is, not, is my normal force. My normal force is going to be equal to my force perpendicular. And my force perpendicular is essentially going to be this component here of gravity. So that's uh, force of gravity times the cosine of theta. <clears throat> so I can plug that into this part of my equation. And let's see what that gives us. So we get one half kx squared equals, oh, excuse me minus uh, force of gravity is mass times gravity cosine of theta times d equals mg sine of theta times d. We just plugged in those two uh, equations into that. And essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to isolate d. Right? Get d on one side and find what that is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add this section over to the other side. And we would get 1 half kx squared. And we'll talk about why this makes sense. Equals uh, mg d sine theta plus mg d cosine theta. And essentially what this is, right, mg d sine theta, that is the energy... Uh, potential due to gravity, and this is the work done, right? So the initial spring energy equals whatever gravitational energy I have at the end, plus the work that I lost due to friction. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to pull out our d value here and say this is one half kx squared equals d times, and I'm also going to pull out mg. So this is mg times uh, the sine of theta plus the cosine of theta. So a lot of algebra with this one, but once we get it set up, right, it's just algebra working through this. And we're going to get d by itself, so we're going to divide each side by mg sine plus cosine theta. So d equals one half kx squared divided by mg times the sine of theta plus the cosine theta. And all of that is going to give us a distance, which is around 11 centimeters or 0 0.11 meters. And we plug our values in. So in this question, it says a car of mass 2,320 kilograms is ascending a sloping road inclined at 10 degrees to the horizontal. The driver sees a hazard and brakes to make an emergency stop. The distance traveled while braking is 22.5 meters. The initial speed of the car is 13.4 <clears throat> meters per second. Calculate the average braking force. Assume air resistance is negligible. So if we look at the idea, right, we're going to draw our picture. We have our car on some ramp, 10 degrees. And we initially have two forms of energy. We're going to have energy kinetic as well as we're going to have energy potential due to gravity.
So this question says an elevator in a tall building is fitted with a counterweight. So here's our counterweight. The total mass of the car and passengers is 882 kilograms. And the counterweight has a mass of 995. A motor lowers the elevator car through a distance of 22.5 meters. So this car is going to travel downwards a displacement of 22, or excuse me, 25.5 meters. <clears throat> Calculate the work done against gravity by the motor. So if we think about this scenario, Naturally, if these pulleys are frictionless and this is just allowed to move, this elevator is actually going to move upwards. It's going to accelerate upwards because the counterweight has a greater mass than the elevator and its passengers. But instead, the elevator is actually getting pulled downwards. So the motor, right, would have to, you know, be in applying some force downwards to move it that way. And if we're trying to calculate the work done against gravity, right? Gravity is actually trying to lift it up. Now, these arrows aren't drawn to scale necessarily, but gravity, based on the fact that this has a bigger weight than this one, is trying to lift the elevator. Um, there is a force of gravity pushing down here, but the force of gravity pushing down here is stronger. And so the tension in the string is actually pulling up. So you could think of this as like the force of the difference of the force of gravity due to this weight here. So the motor actually has to apply a force to pull it down to overcome the gravity difference that's pulling it up. So here's what we can think of work equals energy. Okay. And so we can think of like the amount of work that is done is going to equal the change in energy within our system. All right. So the work done by the motor is external. It's not an equal sign. It's just that's an external work that's done. The work done by gravity is, is going to be internal due to the fact that we're going to say the potential energy, right, MGH, is part of our system, right? So that's why the work done by gravity is internal and the work done by the motor is going to be external work. So what we have to think about is we have to think about this as our entire system. The elevator is going to go down 22.5. The cart or the counterweight is going to go up by that same displacement. So we have to take both of those into account. So what we're going to do <clears throat> is the energy potential of the elevator due to gravity and the energy potential of the counterweight due to gravity. Now, the elevator is going to lose potential energy because it's going down. The counterweight is going to gain potential energy because it is moving upwards. So what we're going to say is that our change in energy is going to be the change in energy potential of our system. <clears throat> okay. Which that is going to be uh, a change in energy potential of the counterweight minus the change in energy potential of the elevator. Now, if we do that, that's going to be mass of the counterweight times gravity times delta H minus mass of the elevator times gravity times delta H. <clears throat> Gravity and delta H is going to be the same for both of them. So it's going to be mass of the counterweight minus mass of the elevator. And that's how I would find my change in energy. Remember, change in energy equals work. So I can plug my values in and I should get a value of <clears throat> roughly 200, excuse me, 28,300 joules. 
That's how much the energy has changed. And, and if we think about that, the energy has gone up because the bigger mass now has more potential and the smaller mass has less potential. This question says a cyclist and bike have a total mass of 92.5 kilograms. They travel eight meters up a rough slope inclined at 30 degrees to the horizontal. The average resistive force is 25 newtons. Their speed increases from 0.1 or 1.25 to 3.25. Calculate the work done by the cyclist in kilojoules. So our scenario is we're going to have an angle here, 30 degrees. That's a pretty steep slope. <clears throat> Our cyclist here is there. And we have a resistive force. So we have some frictional force, some outside force, which is going to be 25 newtons. They have an initial velocity of 1.25. And they're going to have a final velocity at the top of 3.25. <clears throat> we also have our mass here. They're going to travel 8 meters. So up this slope, I'm traveling 8 total meters. S, which is 8. So if we imagine our initial position here, right, as... Oh, let's, let's redo that. If we imagine our initial position here as this is just our height equals zero. We're going to do that just to eliminate any potential energy that they might have. So at position one, oopsie, at position one, and then this is going to be position two at the top, which is eight meters up the ramp. So position one, they're going to have energy kinetic. At position two, they're going to have energy kinetic and energy potential due to gravity. And there is some outside work that is done due to my resistive force. So there is work that's done. Oh, let's change that. So there's work that's done, and that is force times my displacement cosine theta. Now, in this case, our cosine theta should be a negative one. And that's because my displacement is up, my force is back, so the angle between those is going to be 180. And so the cosine of 180 is negative one. So we're going to set up our equation that says energy kinetic initially plus work done by the cyclist minus work done by friction equals energy kinetic at the end plus energy potential due to gravity. So I forgot to say this, right? The cyclist is applying some force upwards to propel them forward, right? So that's the work done that's going to move them upwards um, and their angle is going to be zero so that's going to be positive work so we actually have two works in this scenario writing out my equation then uh, we are trying to solve the work done by the cyclist right so we're going to have i'm going to rewrite this as work done the cyclist equals uh, energy kinetic plus energy potential at the top plus the work done by friction right we're going to add that over and we're going to subtract this over minus energy kinetic at the bottom. So this is position one, position two, position two. <clears throat> so if we write that out, work done by the cyclist equals one half mv squared at two plus mgh plus, <clears throat> uh, that's force of friction times my displacement minus one half mu squared and that U is at position one. So going through this, we know the mass, we know the final velocity, we know gravity, we know the force of friction, we know the displacement up the ramp, and we know the initial velocity. The one thing we don't have is we don't have height. So the first thing we're gonna need to do is we're gonna find H after we set up our equation. So to find H, I'm going to use this ramp again. We know we traveled up eight meters, we know this angle here is 30, and we're trying to find h. So the sine of theta is going to be h divided by 8, or h equals 8 times the sine of 30, or the sine of my angle. So I can plug that into that value there. Once I know everything else, then I can simply plug and solve. If I wanted to clean this up just a little bit, it could be 
one half m. I could then pull out the v squared two minus u two uh, one, excuse me, squared plus mgh plus the force of friction times the displacement. So this is showing that the work done by the cyclist is going to equal the difference of kinetic energies because they were already going some initial kinetic energy. So how much kinetic energy did I gain? Plus the potential energy gained plus the work that was lost due to friction. All that, when I plug that in, <clears throat> I should get a value of around 4.25 kilojoules, right? So 4,250 joules. So this question says, the weight attached to the end of a spring is increased gradually. The variation of the length of the spring with the weight is suspended on, is shown in the graph below. So we have length in centimeters, and then we have weight in neuters, <clears throat> excuse me, newtons. And it asks for what is the spring constant of the spring? And actually the answer here they're allowing um, in newtons per centimeter. So we can just leave this in centimeters. But typically the spring constant is going to be indicated with uh, newtons per meter. Um, but in this case, we can just leave it in newtons per centimeter for this question. So if we look at this, <clears throat> The natural length of the spring is 12 centimeters, right? So if we don't have any weight added to it, the spring is already 12 centimeters. And so as we add weight, right? So as we add two meters, we're, we're moving this far. So we're moving one centimeter. As we add four newtons, we're moving uh, two centimeters. As we're adding six, we are moving three centimeters. So what we can use is we can use that as our understanding of what is that telling us, right? So the spring constant is how much weight do we need for each meter, or in this case, each centimeter for it to move. So we can tell that for every two centimeters, or excuse me, for every two newtons of additional weight, the length of the spring is increasing by one centimeter. So our K value then in this instance is simply gonna be two newtons per centimeter. This question says the machine lifts an object of weight 200 newtons at a constant speed of two meters per second through a vertical distance of four meters. The efficient efficiency of the machine is 25%. What is the input power of the machine? Give your answer in kilowatts, correct? to two sig figs, remember to include units with your answer. So our scenario, if we have our machine here, it's sitting on some table and it's gonna lift some weight here. <clears throat> and that weight is going to travel upwards at a velocity of two meters per second. It has a force of gravity acting down of 200 Newtons, that's its weight. And it's going to be raised a vertical distance of four meters. So what we can look at is we have an efficiency of 25%. So if we think about this, if this is being raised at a constant velocity, like it says it is, then we know that the lift force upwards, which is the tension in the string that's lifting it, is going to equal my force of gravity because the net force must be zero. So the force of gravity is 200 and my tension force is also 200. So we are looking for what is the input power of the machine. So if we look at our equation for efficiency, <clears throat> efficiency is going to be work out over work in, which is also power out over power in. <clears throat> so what we know from the information that's given is that the power out, right? So we know the force of the lift and we also know the velocity that the object is moving at. So that's gonna be 200 times two. So my power is going to be 400 watts. 
So what I can do then is I can simply find the input power on the machine. If I know that the efficiency is 25%, because I can figure out my output power. So the efficiency is going to equal the power out over the power in. So I'm going to get this isolated for power in. So I'm going to multiply each side by the input power. And I'm going to have power in times the efficiency equals the power out. And then I'll just divide each side by my efficiency. And I'm going to get my input power. Power input is going to equal my power output divided by my efficiency. So that's going to be 400 watts, not 200. So 400 watts divided by 0.25. And essentially, when we divide by 1 fourth, it's the same as multiplying by 4. So my input power is going to have to be 1,600 watts or uh, 16 kilowatts for my answer. So how I could write this so that I have the appropriate number of sig figs, um, with only two sig figs, I, I could write this as 1.6 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3 watts, or I could write it as 16 kilowatts. Both of these are going to have two significant figures. This question says, a common safety device at the end of a railroad line is a stiff spring. This prevents the train from crashing into the station if it's not stopped moving before the end of the line by applying it brakes. The train has a mass, and the maximum entry speed of the station is one meter per second. If the spring can compress a minim maximum distance of 50 centimeters, what is the minimum spring constant, which is required to prevent the train from damaging the spring support? Give your answers in two sig figs without units. So, if we think about this scenario, the train is going to have kinetic energy as it comes in. When it ends up hitting the spring, all of that energy is going to be uh, put into the spring as energy potential due to the spring. And so those two are going to equal each other. The spring is going to do work to stop the train. So we could also just put this in as work as well. But if we simply say that all the energy of the train has to go into the potential energy in the spring to stop it, then what is the K value that is required of that? So we're gonna have one half MV squared. It's going to equal one half KX squared. So one thing that can happen is our one halves can go away because we have those on both sides. And we're simply trying to solve for K. So MV squared equals KX squared. So then K is simply going to be mv squared divided by x squared. So our mass is there, the velocity is there, and our maximum distance is 50 centimeters. So we're gonna have to change that to meters, which is going to be 0 0.5 meters. So I'm simply gonna plug those values in, right? We have 1.1 times 10 to the five times a velocity of one squared divided by 0.5 squared. I should then be able to get a K value equal to 440 newtons per meter. So this question says an object experiences a force which changes with displacement according to the following graph. And so we have this force that increases as my displacement gets larger and then decreases as back down to zero as the displacement gets past 12. If the total work done is 1,440 joules, what is the maximum applied force? So force max, give your answer in newtons with two sig figs and without units. So here's what we have to understand. We know that work equals force times displacement. And so if I understand that, right, force times displacement, force times displacement, my work would be the area under this graph, okay? And so if I want to try to find the area of this graph, that's simply a triangle, and I would find my area by saying that's one-half base times height. 
So my base is my displacement. My height is my force. That's my maximum force. So I can simply set these two concepts equal to each other and say, well, I know my work is 1,440 and I'm simply going to try to find then this height because we don't have a constant force. So the work done is going to equal one half base times height, which would be one half force max times my displacement. And that's going to be because we don't have a constant force here, but we have this force which varies with displacement. So we get then two times my work equals force max times my displacement. And we get force max equals two times my work divided by my displacement. So two times uh, 1,440 divided by 24. When I get that, I get 1,000, or excuse me, 116, which it says just two sig figs and without units. So that's going to round up to my force max of 120. This question says a bowling ball has a mass of 10 kilograms is dropped from a height of 10 meters. When it is five meters above the ground, what is the total energy of the ball neglect air resistance? So we're kind of a trick question here, right? If we have a bowling ball that is 10 meters above and it has a mass of 10, right? We can simply do MGH, which is going to be 10 times 10 times 10, <clears throat> uh, which would be a thousand. Right. Uh, if we use 9.8, that would be 980. Now, as the ball falls, so if the ball is now here at only five meters, now the ball has both potential energy and kinetic energy, but it can only have as much energy as it started with. Right. We can't gain or lose energy. So the total energy that it has to have is still what it started with, which is a thousand or 980 joules. Uh, and it says here, take G as 9.81. So this would be 981. Messes in your bottle is thrown off a cliff horizontally at a speed of 15 meters per second. If the cliff is 80 meters above the sea level and ignoring the effects of air resistance, what is the speed the bottle hits as it reaches the sea? Give your answers in meters per second without units and to two sig figs. So we have our bottle and we are a certain distance above and that bottle is going to be thrown into the sea so we're going to land here and so it's initially thrown this way at 15 and really it doesn't matter if it's thrown upwards or downwards it's thrown but it does say horizontally at 15 meters per second so at scenario one it has potential energy due to gravity and it also has kinetic energy because it has some initial velocity when it's here it's simply going to have kinetic energy and it says to ignore air resistance so there's no outside forces that are acting on it as it moves from point one to point two so our equation is going to be energy gravity plus energy kinetic equals energy kinetic so we're going to have one half oh, excuse me we're going to have mgh plus one half mv squared equals one half mv squared. And you could put this as a u as my initial velocity, and this is what we're solving for. We're solving for this final velocity there. One thing we can do is we can cancel out our m's. It doesn't give us the mass of the bottle, and that's okay because it doesn't matter because the masses all go away. And I'm simply going to solve for this final v. So on this side, I'm going to divide by one half and m. Oh, no, nope, not m. We already got rid of m. Um, and so I'm going to get V squared equals, uh, it's a two. So if we divide by a half, that's same as multiplying by two, uh, GH plus one half. I'm going to write it as U squared now. And then we would simply need to square root. And that would get rid of this V squared on this side. And when I plug my values in, then I'm going to get a velocity, which is equivalent to about 42 meters per second.